So this is exposed Drupal with RESPO. Uh, this is the session that you walked in. If you were not looking for this session, please stay because this is going to be cool. I'm, I get overexcited about these things. I have to warn you about that now. Um, and uh, yeah, all this is about Drupal 7. Uh, you've been hearing about Drupal 8 all day. Uh, this is about Drupal 7, but it's going to be available on Drupal 8. So um, this is not the title that I wanted for this session, but apparently the Drupal.org session creation note has some validation, and it doesn't allow you for titles this long. Um, this is what I, I want to present. A comprehensive guide to build an HTTP API without hating yourself six months after release. And this is because um, I've been building and designing APIs for quite some time now, um, in the last two years. Um, and I've been having some hate issues with myself. Um, especially when you uh, design an API for the second time and you say, okay, I'm gonna be smart and I'm not gonna be hitting the same problems that I had the first time. Uh, but then you hit some other problems and you don't solve them perfectly. So I decided to start gathering all these experiences and uh, putting them inside of the, um, on the RESTful module. Um, and uh, yeah, that's what I've been doing. So this session uh, aims for two simple goals, right? If you walk out of here, I would like you to have these two concepts in mind, uh, if anything. So first one is that REST is, is not just exporting an entity. So it's not just uh, taking a node, doing JSON encode, and putting it out there. That's fine. Uh, that covers lots of use cases, um, but REST is not only that. I mean, if you want to create a simple widget for your site, maybe that's enough. But that's not REST. REST is full CRUD, create, read, update, and delete. Um, it's also authentication. You wouldn't want to serve to your anonymous users the content the same way that you serve them to authenticated users, right? So you have to deal with authentication, with access, who can view that, uh, who can create what. So um, there's authentication. And how, how do you authenticate an HTTP request where passing a cookie feels very awkward. So yeah, there's uh, a lot of other stuff that I'm gonna be talking about uh, which uh, relates to REST, which is filtering listings. Um, sometimes you don't want everything. Uh, or doing pagination, ranges, etc. And the other concept is that RESTful can do a lot of that for you, for free. Uh, and by free, I mean free in all of the senses. Um, some, of the, some of the cool things of the RESTful module are data providers. So when you're exposing stuff with the RESTful module, you're not limited to entities, which is uh, mostly what you're gonna be doing the 90% of the time, but you are not limited to that. Uh, you can expose maybe a database table, uh, something custom that you had to do because, you know, uh, you know how projects work. I know why you have to expose a table, but you can do it. Um, uh, a use case for that could be menus. Um, also, uh, another thing that you could be exposing, and we are doing that, is exposing um, the plugins, the plugin system, either if it's uh, C tools or another system. So you're not exposing anything that's it's actually in the database, but something that are files and uh, it's there. So you can uh, basically expose whatever you want, and all of the principles that I'm gonna be talking about apply to those. Another benefit of the RESTful module is the resource composition and uh, what I call the URL query language. Um, these two things, um, I, I was actually very happy to see how uh, Graf GraphQL uh, this morning introduced these, these topics. A resource composition is basically when you have an entity that relates another entity. It's super annoying that uh, you have, let's say, an article that has three tags, and then when you get the, um, the response for that article, you get three tag IDs, 
and then you have to do three more requests for every tag. And if you stop there, that's cool, but maybe you have to dig further and uh, keep making requests. So making HTTP requests is uh, often expensive in terms of performance. So resource nesting uh, or resource composition, what it does is it takes the, um, the resource and embeds it into the original response. So you would get a JSON output with the article and the JSON for the tags in there. Uh, and that's pretty cool. So imagine this clone of TripAdvisor. You had this idea, I'm gonna clone TripAdvisor and I'm gonna become rich. And you call it uh, Voyage Concelier. So I built this slide for Montpellier and it was cool that it was in French. Uh, so in Catalan it's Concelier de Viaggia. Uh, so the site is to find restaurants and restaurants have deals apply that apply to them and uh, all this stuff. So you decide that you're gonna build this uh, with Drupal because Drupal is an awesome content management system. And uh, it allows you to build your content model, to do, to do it in a structured way. And uh, it's, it's awesome at, be, at dealing with that. So another thing that you decide is, is that you are gonna go decouple. For, there are several reasons to, to do it. So you analyze, you analyze your reasons and you say, okay, I'm gonna have to build not only a site, but also an Android app and an iOS app. So I'm gonna build it decoupled. And the first thing that you realize that you need is an HTTP API. So uh, when you're designing an HTTP API, what you're basically writing, it's a contract between your backend team and your frontend team. So um, you as a Drupal developer or a backend developer, you sit at your desk and you think about the data model. In this case, you think about uh, how a restaurant needs to have a title and a description and also needs to have a um, relationship to the deals content type, um, only that you don't think in content type ways uh, because this is decoupled, right? Um, you could take out Drupal and with that API designed, put something else in, in, in its place. So you write the API design as a contract. It's basically the promise of the backend team that you're gonna deliver that set of URLs, in this case could be slash restaurants slash ID, and that hitting that URL is gonna return with a JSON payload. In this case, it could be ID equals a number and then label equals uh, this is uh, the best restaurant in Barcelona and the description uh, could be, I don't know, the description of the restaurant. So um, you document that, you deliver this to the front end team and then you start working. But the cool part is, the, is that the front end team can start working at the same time in parallel building on the assumption that you're gonna fulfill your promise. So um, when you're building this HTTP API or you're designing it rather, um, you should be avoiding all of the um, Drupalisms that uh, typically get in your way. And that is because as I said before, uh, when you're building decoupled sites or decoupled apps, you are uh, able to swap out any of the parts, even if it's the back end or the front end, and uh, replace it with another thing, or maybe introduce some duplication uh, for you know, uh, when one is down, you have the other one. So imagine a situation where you uh, don't think that Drupal is cool anymore, and then you implement that with, I don't know, a Node.js app using Express. It would be very lame to have to implement in Node.js an API that fakes that it's a Drupal installation because in your API design you have things like use a slash node slash node ID because slash node doesn't make sense outside of Drupal, right? What you really want is slash restaurants and then uh, probably a UUID instead of an ID because if you use uh, auto incremental IDs then people can start guessing but that's not stuff. So, um, that's one of them. Uh, there are 
there are a bunch, but the most important ones is, um, or I get annoyed by the fact that I don't want to have field underscore and then the name of the field. This morning I, I was trying to, to understand why this was happening in field UI, um, but you really want to have the control to say the output of my restaurant JSON document uh, is tags or city or label, description, something clean, something that uh, doesn't leak Drupal all over it. So uh, the last one, and this is my, my, this is my favorite. Uh, you really want to have your description and then have your description, like description equals blah, and not, and I have to look at this, have description be an object with a key of and, and that be an array of one value that contains an object that has a key of value that contains blah. So um, these are some of the goals that you need to achieve by uh, doing um, a good API, a good API design. So uh, another, another thing that I learned through sweat and blood is that you really want to version your API. So if you don't version your API, it means two things. Uh, it means that uh, you assume that there will only be a single client ever for your API, and uh, I guess that you cannot really know that for sure. And it also means that you're uh, a bit masochist and you like very painful deploys. So let me explain, uh, let me explain that. So imagine this situation where you're building Voyage Conciliar and you have your API and you release it to, you release it to the world and uh, create your app. Let's say that you're building an Android app and uh, it's working, but then you get a new feature and you get to evolve the API and uh, you know that evolving the API means that you're breaking the existing code, but it's okay, you haven't deployed that. Uh, it's breaking the existing app, but since you haven't deployed that, um, nothing happens yet. So you work in your dev servers, and you work on the Android, Android app code that uses the new features, and everything works, right? So it's time for deploy. You need to deploy both the API and the Android app. So you deploy the API first. At that point, uh, when you have deployed the API, your apps, uh, your existing Android app, let's call it the old Android app, is not working because it's not 100% uh, compatible with the um, with the new API, right? Uh, but it's okay. Uh, you can you can assume some some downtime. So uh, right after that, you go and deploy your your Android app, your new one, that's gonna click together with the new API and it's gonna be awesome. But uh, something happens, the deploy doesn't work as expected, so you don't panic. You roll back uh, to an Android app that doesn't work with the new API. You don't panic, you roll back to the old API and then try to figure out how you have to to manage all this, the new, uh, the new debugging with uh, the new API and the old API, so that's a big mess. So uh, the simple thing to do is that you create the new version of the API while the old one is still being served and existing, you deploy the code, but your old Android app is locked to version 1.3 of the API. So it's it keeps working, you don't have even downtime uh, when you do the, um, the deploy. And then you, you do the release for the new Android app and uh, it's breaking, but it's okay. You revert and, uh, and, and the old Android app is using version 1.3 even if you have deployed version 1.7 or whatever. So uh, that gives you that uh, flexibility and also uh, having versions allows you to release the API to the world and have people build clients for it 
and you are happy because they are doing your, your job for free. And then uh, they can log to different versions depending on the time where they built it and the features that were available. So uh, having your API versioned is, is like the basics. You cannot get away without it. And um, of course, all of these thoughts are, um, are introduced in the, in the RESPO module. Um, so we have been uh, working on the RESPO module for quite some time yet, but um, the, the motto of the module is that we are always looking for the practical use case. So um, if I were to propose a feature, a crazy feature, I do that sometimes, uh, and I put it in a pull request, Amitai would ask me, do you have a real use case for this? So we, we try to keep that in, that in mind, but at the same time, we try to uh, stick to the best practices. We uh, research what other people are doing. Uh, we research what the academic way of implementing this is, but without obsessing about getting a medal for it, because nobody gives medal to developers anymore. So one of the first things that you uh, that you will notice if you use the RESTful module, I, it's that it's developer oriented. Um, so when when I was writing this slide, it came to my mind a conversation that I had some time ago about uh, how great is Drupal that allows non-technical users create awesome digital experiences and websites without having to code anything. With they're basically programming with a mouse, and that's that's really impressive. And I love the fact that you can download the meta tags module, enable it, and go to the node, and just type the meta tags, and forget that those did those go inside of the body HTML tag or was it in the head? And do I have to put the value inside of value equals? I don't care. I have the meta tags module, and I just do use the UI. So that is awesome. But then um, there is also the example of the migrate to module, uh, which sh shipped, shifted from having you know, uh, to maintain a very big UI for creating um, migrations with table wizard and, and all that, uh, because all of the complexity in those cases lives in the, in the UI. So they shifted to a, to a way of doing things where they just wanted migrations to be classes, and they, those got run because, you know, a migration is a complex thing, and you don't want a non-technical user or non-technical non person doing your migrations, right? So um, we think that uh, doing uh, a REST API requires this kind of technical knowledge. There are other solutions in the Drupal world that don't and allow you to create, uh, to expose some fields and some stuff uh, using a mouse. If you can get away with those, just, just do it. If you don't need any of these, you, you don't have to worry about this. But if you want to have control and you, have to, you want to use um, the cool features that are implemented in, in here, know that this is uh, oriented to developers, and this slide is very red. Um, so in, in the RESTful module, uh, we do everything in plugins. Um, in the version 1.x and the 2.x, uh, we use different plugin systems. In 1.x, we use the Seedles plugin, and uh, in 2.x, we use a, a backport to Drupal 7 of the Drupal 8 plugins, uh, which is pretty nice. And um, it's, it's very easy uh, by uh, everything is a plugin. I mean that a resource is a plugin, an authentication provider is a plugin, and uh, yeah, everything is a plugin. So if you have to, if you're not satisfied with what uh, it comes out of the box, assume that you can write a plugin that uh, has most of the work done for you, that you can implement the um, only the things that you want to do differently, and then you can use it. So 
Uh, creating a plugin is not that complicated. Um, and, oh, let me go back. So um, I added 1.x and 2.x, like these small batches at the, at the bottom of the slides. So you can know that uh, I'm talking about one version or the other when I'm, when I'm presenting a slide. Basically, I'm gonna be talking about both at the same time, most of the time. So how do I create um, a plugin? So the version two uses the Drupal 8 style plugins, uh, and this is called an annotation. So to create this, you just have to create a class file. It's, a, it's just a regular class inside of a directory. Uh, you will learn how to, how to create that, and you will use it for D8 plugins. Um, but the, the key is that you have to add um, an annotation, which is a special comment. Uh, do you see this add resource in there? That means that it's an annotation. In there, you provide some metadata. So the important parts here are marked in, in green, orange, and blue. So uh, you can see that the name contains the word articles. That is the resource identifier, and that's what's gonna be used by uh, when, when you are hitting a URL. It's gonna be a slash articles. So 1.5, it's the version. So realize how hard it is to create a new version. You just create this, and instead of 1.5, use 1.6, and there you go. You have your new version, and you, you can still hit the old versions. Um, so uh, apart from that, we said that we had uh, what is called data providers, the, that we would be using the entities most of the time. Uh, so in here, we are using the node entity type with the articles bundle. So that's 50% of the work that you have to do to expose uh, a resource. So it's not that hard. The other 50% is this. Basically I said that you should be able to have control in how you expose things. Uh, it's not just a straight serialization of the, of the entity, right? So you require some mapping. And mapping um, a field, it's uh, as simple as creating an array and returning it. In this case, what we are doing is we want to have a um, public property called cool text uh, when you're exporting um, an article. And you want the content of that property called cool text to be extracted from field underscore cool underscore text. So that's it. Uh, that's how you define a resource. And when you're done, you get a lot of stuff for free. Um, so when you're using an HTTP API in the real world, uh, you don't only uh, get to hit the resource slash ID, right? Uh, you need to do listings. So um, give me a list of all of the articles that, that I have, but give the list sorted by a particular property. So if you exposed a property called cool text, you could sort a list by cool text. If you expose the creation date, you can sort by the creation date. So basically when you expose that array, you're not only providing an output, but you're also providing ways to sort, filter, and range, and do a lot of stuff. So sort is pretty straightforward. Um, filter, uh, you can filter by any property. So if you uh, want to get all of the articles uh, that have a title of this is a cool article, you can do that. You just uh, use in the URL filter equals, filter title equals cool article, and, and that's it. We'll see an example later. So um, after that, uh, there is the range, which is basically the, the front end team. They don't want like a gazillion articles when they are building just this uh, slider or carousel. I don't know the front end lingo. Um, so this thingy where they have a thumbnail and a title, uh, but they only have four of them, they provide a range, right, or a limit, a max number of items. So they say, just give me four articles, don't give me 50, because I'm only gonna use four. And 
uh, the, the cool features are, the sparse field sets. So um, when you're getting the output of a big content type, and who doesn't have a big content type with a lot of fields, right? Um, the, the front end gets a giant payload, gets a lot of data with all of the fields, even if they only need the thumbnail and title. So with the sparse field sets, what you can do is specify which fields you want to have in the payload that the server is returning. So you can limit and tailor the, um, the response based on what your needs are as a front-end client. So uh, that allows you to do a lot of performance improvements, especially when you combine that with resource nesting that we talked before, like getting the related entities inside of the original entity. So uh, with those combined, you can uh, pretty much get tailored responses with the client needs. So uh, that uh, gets you to a point where you only have to design the API and let the front end design what they want to get, right? And if the design changes, the design of the Android app, you don't care. They just make the call differently and get the data that it's available. So that was for reading, but for, uh, for updating and creating entities, there's also uh, good stuff that, that you get for free. Uh, you get entity validation. Um, and entity validation works with a separate contrib module. Um, but the, the idea here is that entity validation in Drupal uh, only works at the form level. So you're validating a form. You're not validating an entity. So that's in Drupal 7. Um, so what you're doing with the entity validator module is you create some rules saying, describing uh, my article to be valid has to comply with these, uh, with these rules that I'm, that I'm defining. So when you're, creating, um, when you're creating an entity with the RESTful module, what you do is if you have the entity validator module enabled, uh, it validates your entity for you and you get a cool error handling back saying that, you remember the cool text? It wasn't cool enough, so sorry, uh, try harder and improve your, your entity, right? So uh, that and resource nesting. You don't have to create the three different tags before you can create the article to get the IDs to put in there. You just get the JSON object with the article properties and the property for the tags and everything gets created in one request. So, big improvement. So this is just a representation of what I mean by resource nesting. Uh, you see that uh, you can have a meal, uh, and a particular meal can have or will have an ice cream, and ice creams can have different toppings. So uh, imagine if you have to traverse all that making HTTP requests, uh, that would be lots of them. So this is what you get when you get a list of articles, okay? So I'm hitting a slash API slash articles, uh, so that means that I'm requesting all of the articles with all of the fields for the articles with the default sort and no filters. So I'm seeing there that there are three articles that come back. Uh, the first two only have ID, la label, and body, and the last one also has some tags. The first two don't have tags because no one tag them. So um, this, is, this is what you get, and with the URL, you can control what you get back. So in this other example, what I'm asking for is give me all of the articles that have the label of lorem, and you give me them sorted by ID. So uh, if, if you see there, there are only two articles uh, instead of the three that we had, and that's because uh, some of them don't meet the filter of having the label equal lorem. And uh, you see that the first one is ID 5 and the second one 42 because they are sorted by, by ID. And uh, notice here that you always interact with the public fields. So you're not saying sort by node ID. 
So this is always shielded from, from, from the front-end developer. So Drupal is not leaking outside. So uh, after that, you, you specify that you only want the fields ID and tags. You don't care about the label because you know it's going to be lorem. You're filtering for uh, all of the articles that are, are, that are lorem. So yeah, you, you can get, you know, a really specific and uh, build the call that you need for the view that you're, that you're building from the front end perspective. The RESTful module uh, is working with versions, uh, as I said before, and there are typically two ways where how um, people implement version negotiation. And version negotiation is uh, how the client or the consumer of the API tells the server, hey, I want version 1.3 and not version 2.0. So some people do it in the URL, some people do it in headers. Both of them have use cases. Uh, in my opinion, both of them have valid use cases. So in the RESTful module, we support both and in an interchangeable way. So you could uh, you know, send a URL uh, to your non-technical PM with the version in there because you don't want to explain him how to uh, you know, pass a header to the browser, so the negotiation. Now, you just Give them, give them a URL, and they hit that, and they see the, um, the results. So yeah, you can use both. Uh, and also, if you want to, to negotiate the version inside of the media type, uh, you could do that. So uh, the, one, of the, um, one of the features that uh, are imported from Drupal 8 are the authentication providers. Um, this is not in Drupal 7, so uh, we went away and borrowed the concept from authentication providers from Drupal 8, and we implemented that. So what that means is that uh, you have a way to authenticate your requests, and you can do it in several different ways, because remember, these are plugins. So one plugin will allow you to authenticate your requests using cookie authentication, uh, that means that if you send a session cookie along with your request, uh, you can authenticate uh, yourself as an admin and get more fields, or uh, maybe you can get access to create some content type. Um, another one is basic auth, uh, which basically means that you're sending your username and password along with every request, uh, and you should only do that on encrypted connections by the way, and uh, there are another one that's called token bearer, which is passing along a token. So there, there are different authentication types, and you can build your own. So if you want to, if you have a use case where you only want to authenticate requests if they send the username and password and a picture of a cute kitten, you can do that. Or you can implement LDAP, which would be more useful. And another, another feature is rate limits. Um, this is basically saying, okay, this role, uh, the anonymous user can only hit my API X times during this period of time. So uh, you can say maybe they can only hit your API 20 times in an hour or 100 times in a week, et cetera, et cetera. This is to avoid DDoS attacks and it will even give you a nice message uh, like uh, it's, I think it's 429 error code telling you that uh, you exceeded the quota. Uh, try again, and then we'll tell you when you will get a new, uh, the new period for, for getting the, um, the response. So again, this is, um, this is a plugin, so you could implement uh, a plugin that gets, you know, uh, during nighttime, uh, it allows you to make more requests than during daytime, um, et cetera. Uh, I have to admit that I've been lying to you the whole session because I've been talking about JSON all the time. But you don't only get to work with JSON uh, because you have output formats. So what that means is that uh, we have output format plugins that will allow you to expose your, your Drupal through XML, through uh, JSON API, which is a uh, JSON specification, uh, and uh, yeah, 
whatever you want to build. Uh, you want to build YAML? I suppose you're, you do build with YAML. Uh, you, can, you can build that. And basically, uh, what that means is that with RESTful, you only worry about gathering the information. And then you defer the format to the client. So they can ask, give me the stuff in XML, because this is an Android app that uses Java in, in a framework that works well with XML. That's fine. They decide. Uh, but at the same time, the same resource can be served in JSON or in HAL JSON. So um, yeah, this gives a lot of flexibility. So we only get the info, and then with output formats, we, we can show it in different ways. And this is where, uh, where your mind should start blowing up. So um, this, all this, it's auto-discoverable. So what this means is that you don't need to write a single line of documentation. Don't write documentation. Just allow people to discover the API. So when you browse the API at the root homepage, uh, at slash API, what you will get is a list of all of the all of, of all of the resources that are available for that site. And I realize that you cannot read this. Don't worry. Uh, this is just a list of all of the resources that are available. And since this is just another resource, it's a resource that serves resources. Uh, you can do filtering. You can do sorts, etc., uh, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, et cetera. So here you can discover that you have. Um, let's say, an articles resource. But that doesn't help you much, right? Because you want to know what's inside of the articles resource. So by doing an options call or an options request to a single article, you will get an explanation of what is inside of the, of the article. So uh, options is just a regular HTTP verb like get and post, etc. So do you get something like this? Don't try to read it. Uh, what you get is, uh, okay, uh, you got an articles resource, but what's in there? And doing this, what it gives you is, it gives you the information that there's a label. So this is all the information for, for a label. And this label, uh, you, you have this property that is called label, uh, has this description, uh, which could be, uh, this is the label of the resource that uh, it's implied from the title, et cetera, et cetera, some documentation there. And then uh, things get interesting because it gives you information about the schema of the property. Uh, label is a string of 20, uh, 255 characters, which is not required, and it's read-only, and it's cardinality of one. So... Doing this allows you to introspect the API and know that label is a string and you should expect this to be a string. And you can assume that you can pass this to the front end team and they know how to deal with this. Um, all the things that you can do, and this is also out of the box, is imagine that you also document a form element for this particular property. So for a label, you, would, be, uh, you will, would build a text field of length 255 uh, with a placeholder and, uh, you know, uh, just like you do it in the, in the form API. So uh, that makes you, um, th that allows you to, as a front-end developer, build a library that reads this and creates forms automatically. Instead of you going there and writing the HTML in a React template for every property that you have in the articles, you just build a library that reads this. So when you add a new property, that library automatically creates the new form element. So that's only an example of the cool things that you can do with introspection and auto-discovery. So this is out of the box. And remember, all this because you wrote an annotation and a single mapping. So if you liked the uh, GraphQL example this morning, you are also going to like uh, JSON API. Because JSON API, it's, um, 
it's basically a specification. Uh, they say that uh, it paints your bike shed, uh, which basically means that uh, it just does what you otherwise would have to discuss uh, a lot to get to a similar solution. So JSON API has uh, a lot of cool things that I don't have to I don't have time to explain in four minutes and 25 seconds. So go check it yourself. Uh, I put up there some demos. Um, I don't want it to, to do a live demo because that's scary. So I recorded some videos. I put up some code. The code is very simple. It's just a feature that spices up a little bit the articles and page content types to get it more interesting to have um, entity reference fields, etc. And then another module that creates the resources for those spiced up content types. And then when you have that installed in your site, uh, go and watch the, the videos, which are silent, by the way. Uh, but you, you'll see, uh, hopefully you, you will get the point. So you coming back to the, uh, to the meals example, uh, you can do uh, very cool things like, and uh, it's, you know, explaining this is super hard, so it's, it's okay if you don't fully get it. So uh, you can, could do things like, okay, give me all of the meals which have ice creams that have a topping that has the name of chocolate, right? And that may seem stupid, but uh, when you go to the real world, you may have uh, to list I know, uh, videos that belong to a TV show that is uh, marked as being available for Apple TV. So from the Apple TV, you want to only get the videos that belong to TV shows that you have the rights, the legal rights, to show them in an Apple TV. So um, doing that with, um, you know, simple exposing uh, click and be done uh, systems, that is very hard. And, you know, there are other combinations that you could be doing. Uh, sorry, in that other example, what you do is you call the slash meals and then you filter by ice cream dot toppings. So you basically traverse the relationships through the name of the, of the field. So meals have a title, uh, sorry, a field of ice cream and ice creams have a title of, uh, a field of toppings. So um, when you want to filter by nested resources, what you do is you basically you traverse by the, by the field names. But, you know, you could all also want it to, uh, no, 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 but that's not what I wanted to do. I didn't want all of the meals that had ice creams that had a topping of chocolate. I just wanted all of the meals and then limit the toppings to the ones that are chocolate. So these things get crazy, uh, and there are a lot of use cases. And if you think that uh, there are some that should be included, uh, be, feel free and reach out and go contrib to go uh, contribute to the issue queue. And that's it. Also, before I forget, and we'll go to, to questions, um, there's sprints on Friday, and don't miss them. And if you liked what you saw today, go and do an evaluation on, on, the, on the session. If you didn't like, just forget that I showed you this. So any questions? Hi. Uh, Firstly, I'd like to say that I'm using it and it's uh, amazing and amazing simple and um, it's suitable so uh, in its best. And uh, my question is, could it be possible to create entity bundles using post requests? So y you mean like creating uh, the Creating the entity bundle, like making it available to, to Drupal, like uh, you yes. have um, an, to create a new content type? Yes. 
Yeah, I, I don't see why not. Um, maybe uh, there are some nasty details that I'm overlooking, but you could make a data provider, but that would be not out of the box. You could make a data provider that interacted with Drupal's API to create the, the bundles. So basically what you would end up doing is um, having a custom hook entity info alter that reads from the records of the, of the resource and then it creates the, the bundle. It would certainly be uh, you know, scary to, to build. But yeah, I, I think it would be doable. And another question, you said you do, that are using C tools plugins generally, but uh, I'm, uh, I think that some things there are entities, like the um, uh, the authentication, I think, uh, because you you are setting them as entities there. Is that true? I'm not sure I got that question. The authentication uh, plugin are entities, not C tools plugin. Oh, um, okay. So yeah, we're maintaining uh, 1.x and 2.x, and the uh, line gets blurry. But in, I think um, in it's one, it's in one version one, but. In version one, um, I think that Cetals plugin, I may be wrong. I would need to to check it. Okay, Amitai says that it's a Cetals plugin. So yeah, uh, I think I, those are also Cetals plugins. I have stickers for everyone that asks a question. Uh, hi. Uh, I apologize, it may seem uh, stupid, but from what you showed today, um, I don't see why we need a special module for this. Why are, aren't we using views for this? Like you create listings, you can sort, filter, uh, select range, and you just call from a URL. Why, why is there a module for this and not views? So if you are not missing anything with views, uh, then you don't need this module. But, but um, if you need to create something, uh, maybe you need to allow users in that Boyas Consular example to create a deal for, for the restaurant or to add a comment. Um, you cannot do that with views, right? If you want uh, to throttle your 